Hello and welcome to the very first episode of our Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution by the Group of International Communists Reading Group Series. We are reading this second edition, which has just been translated into English for the first time just this last year. So get yourself a copy if you want to read along with us. I've been extremely excited by this book over the last few months and I'm very much enjoying this reading group. So now you all get to listen along too. This time I did most of the talking myself as people were just getting used to the whole being on a podcast reading group. But safe to say it all gets a lot more collaborative in the coming sessions. This week I got the new patrons Christopher Douglas, Mac Aroni and John Tease in the tank. If you'd like to join in, or get access to all the extra Patreon-only episodes and the Discord server, head on over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. Some of the early questions and contributions by people were lost during recording, so apologies for that. Okay, let's hit it. I'm going to jump in here to the forward to the second edition, and we'll kick off. The discussion about the first edition of these fundamental principles has shown that this book is often seen as a kind of a plan, which must be propagated diligently until the masses have become familiar with the economic organisation based on working hours. This, of course, can never be the intention of the authors, who are based on historical materialism. The entirety of the views that we can summarise in one word as the ideal of the future does not arise through the books or oral propaganda. These do not have much more than an ordering function. They can only make conscious the truth of experience and bring it into a more general context. The masses hardly read or do not read at all, but from the practice of everyday life, certain views are evoked as political and economic ideal. At present, the political economic ideal of the masses, both socialist and communist and Catholic, Christian and neutral workers, is that the state should be the great general representative of their interests. The practical effect of this is that the masses are focused on state capitalism, even if they are not aware of it. This state capitalist orientation of the masses did not come about through propaganda or through books, but crystallised as the experiential truth of the time that lies behind us. In the previous era of parliamentary struggles for social reforms, the development of trade unions in which unions became semi-state corporations, the masses experienced an increase in their standing of living compared to, for example, 100 years earlier. This, in their view, made the state the great lever that would increasingly order social life for their salvation and led to the idea that the repressive state of the past should become the general welfare state. That is why National Socialism could and can anchor itself so deeply in the broad masses. Okay, Senna. Yeah, I, I think that's generally, I think that's correct. Like, I had a guest on the show recently, we were talking about the anthropology stuff, Daniel Bitten. He was talking about, I think, the peasants' revolt in England. And when they, when the troops were away fighting in France or something, and they led their revolt, they brought 140,000 men to London. And basically, they appealed to the king. Instead of taking over their power, it was the king through which they saw was their way to change things. Because he... They could appeal to the king because the king was the one they would appeal to through the courts normally. If there was something wrong, if their lord was bad to them, it would go to kind of a central, like a king's court as opposed to a lord's court. I'm sure there are people in England that know this history better than me. But like carrying on in that kind of situation... I, I think that this analysis is correct. It, 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 today, like I often, I've made the case on the show previously that I felt that the kind of radical movements that are starting to bubble up would, would nearly have to go through the state form initially, that I think that's the logic that people have been told, that I think they have to go, go the wrong way before they can, re- can realise the, the proper strategy. Now, how many times do you have to go through this same idea of appealing to the good king? I don't know. 
Anybody else have any comments? Okay, Alex would like to speak. Yep, yeah, fire ahead, Alex. <coughs> He's saying that, like, yeah, the state that you are existing in right now is where you have found your your solace previously. So this is where this is where we should go to get our our, our socialism. We should go through the state. If you think about the the national socialism, like they kept the general uh, relations between capitalists and workers the same. So it was like a change of political leadership and an introduction of more more state planning but it wouldn't have been like a the workers taking the over the state and uh, and reforming it like in a revolutionary manner I, I would also say like what's important here is that he makes the case as well for this idea of this not being a kind of an, an, ide- an idealist plan the most important thing about this book for us to understand is that he's not laying out a plan saying we get up at four o'clock in the morning and, you know, we have goats in this shed over here. And then beside the goats, we got chickens. Yeah, because the chickens get on well with the goats. And then we're going to have, you know, a place across here where we'll have a shower and we won't have the shower too close to where the goats are because it'll smell of goat shit. He's laying down like the basic fundamental political economy that is required for a future socialist society to work like what's important about this as well is that he 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 points to like the actual experience in the revolution kind of foretold what the basic structure should be i think that's a very important and deep point the idea of the workers council this mirror image of the capitalist firm right is the is is the basis for what the future socialist society would need to be organized around and I think that's a, a deep point. It's not an idealist point saying we're coming up with a plan and we can everybody can understand the plan and we can impose it. It's more about like learning from history and then you know, analysing capitalism and seeing also what went wrong with the political economy of the first attempts at like communist socialist republics. And all this together will feed in. So it's trying to get away from this idea of it as in a kind of a Uh, I suppose, get away from that uh, utopian socialist idea that you can design it in a a, a book and then implement it. Anybody else got a hand up? Illuminatus would like to speak. Yeah, I think it says something deep as well about like why National Socialism was able to to attract so many people that would have had socialist leanings. Like there was elements of the SPD that went into the National Socialism, the Nazi party. Isn't that correct? I think I think the Strasserites, I think the Strasser brothers were like quite high up in the SPD and they went into it, like the left of the Nazi party, as far as I'm aware. Let, let, let's try the next period here. In the coming period of the class struggle, the fighting conditions are completely different. The parliamentary democracy of the political parties and the economic democracy of the collective agreements no longer work to the advantage of the masses, so that they are voluntarily or reluctantly driven into mass action under their own leadership. Besides, the state no longer appears to be an improver of living standards, but a direct representative of big business. In this massive struggle between capital and labour, which includes an entire development period, the ideal of the future of state capitalism rotates with the notions of class struggle. Every mass action under their own leadership shows in small detail what will one day be the general principle of social life. Here, the masses take their destiny into their own hands by carrying out all the tasks necessary for the struggle, either themselves or through functionaries chosen by them and subordinated to them. The coming process of development is an ascent to this growth of the class unit. And only when this class unit has become the common property of the masses does it have the power to overthrow capitalism. And only in this sense can it be said that the new society is born out of the womb of the old. The self-determination of the masses, born from the necessity of struggle, then becomes the guiding principle of the new organisation of social life. 
There, the class struggle itself is the actual driving force in the destruction of the state capitalist future ideal of the masses. So this book can never replace this class struggle. It only wants to express economically what will happen politically. For this, it was necessary not to take the abolition of private property in the means of production as a starting point, but the abolition of wage labour. Okay, so th this is really kind of important stuff here. Like, the most important thing here for me is this line here, where he puts what is fundamental to the actual struggle. Not the idea of nationalising all property under the state's control, but it's the abolition of wage labour. And this is something we're going to come into again and again and again in the book. We're going to, it's this idea of wage labour being destroyed. And the way you destroy wage labour is by, by labour time accounting. At a very deep level, it's changing the economic measure. L let's see, does anybody else have, have anything to say here? What else have we had in this little section? Yeah, well, what do people think about this bit, he, about where he talks about, let's have a look here, that the uh, the political parties and the economic democracy of the collective agreements no longer work to the advantage of the masses? Uh, that, that was me, Tom. It was actually the next sentence I was going to speak about. Does anyone have an idea what the sentence beginning in this massive struggle between capital and labour, which includes an entire development period, does anyone know what that means? Okay. So he's talking here about state capitalism. So let's read the sentence again. In this massive struggle between capital and labour, which includes an entire development period, the idea of the future of state capitalism rotates with the notions of class struggle. So he's juxtaposing here state capitalism, which is what they term like the Soviet experiment here. And they're going to say the ideal of the future state capitalism rotates with the notions of class struggle. You know, that class struggle is actually bound up in state capitalism. I think that's the point he's he's trying to get to here. Like, not only is there a struggle in the West, say, developed capital parts between like labour and capital and in capitalist societies, but there's also a struggle between labour and essentially state capital in state capitalist societies. OK, yeah, we're going to get to see some of that later on in some of the later chapters where he has research in there, you know, statistics from from the Soviets themselves from the 20s and talking about the labor relations and the amount of strikes, you know, and, and stuff like that and show how the workers in Russia were actually striking against the state capital, you know, against the Soviet bureaucracy. So he's making that point that it's both in the capitalism and with state capitalism, the, the class struggle is still going on. But also, again, getting back here to this bit here about talking about from today now, the parliamentary democracy of the political parties and the economic democracy of the collective agreements no longer work to the advantage of the masses so that they are voluntarily or reluctantly driven into mass action under their own leadership. Like that to me rings a lot of bells for today. The one thing I would say is that we don't have uh, our own leadership, you know, but that the, you know, we've got no leadership there is no revolutionary, no Marxist leadership of any note in any of the Western countries that is worth a damn. I, I don't see it. Maybe somebody will prove me wrong. Uh, okay, Alex would like to speak again. Far ahead. Yeah, uh, no, just on that sense of the message, but, but what year was the uh, general strike in the UK? Wow, was it? It was around this time, wasn't it? 1920, 1922? No, it was later than that. What was it about, Alex? Because I, I don't know the... Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah the UK. It, it was... Um, I was just a... a well, it was the biggest genocide they have been for like 50 years or something. But the, the, that sentence describes it perfectly because the Labour Party took absolutely no part in it whatsoever. Just, it, you pretended it wasn't happening for, for, for about two weeks. And the unions did little more uh, either. It, it, you know, it, it really was a, a mass action under the workers' own leadership. You know, sadly unsuccessful. That was it. I just looked at their 1926 general general strike. Yeah. So this would be, yeah, this would be after that. Do people see the Labour Party? They did under Corbyn, I think, a bit see it as a, as a way that they could gain succour from the state. But that was driven into the ground. In America, I think the same thing has happened to Bernie. Let's let's just read the last little section here then. All thoughts based on this and our research leads us to the conclusion that the workers who came to power in mass movements can only hold this political power if they abolish wage labour in economic life 
by taking working time as a central axis around which economic life moves. Okay, and just this sentence here. With the reorientation of the revolutionary groups within the German working class, we find a group that, for the first time in the German workers' movement, combines the struggle for the workers' councils directly with the introduction of communism based on working hours. Work here is the central category that regulates the mutual relations of people in social life. It is the basis for the new legal relations. Now, maybe Julian, or if there's anybody else who's German, might know which party he's talking about there. I assume it's the KAPD, which was a split from the KPD, were the councillists. So I presume that's who he's talking about there. Now, you know, one thing I think that's very important for us, the, the thing that I think is, is best about this book is to understand the political economy that's coming out of it. Now, I think the KAPD, uh, so the, the councillists that Jan Appel and these guys were a part of, as far as I know, they kind of, I have to do more research into it, but they kind of very much rejected all kind of bourgeois political parties and unions as not being any good for the workers' movement. And I think that that is something that's understandable coming through the time, you know, of seeing the failures of the SPD and seeing the failures of unions at the time that they were so integrated into the state. But I think you can throw the baby out with the bathwater. So, like, whether we'll end up agreeing with the political strategy of these council communists, I, I personally don't think I will. But I, 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 I definitely feel like the political economy and their insights are 100% correct. As in, like, I think they describe the political economy, how it should be, you know, how it's developed and, you know, what, what we should be aiming for correctly in its core foundational aspects. But, like, how you get from A to B is a very different thing than just describing B correctly. You know what I mean? So if anybody has any got any other things to say, I think we'll head back and we'll do Herman's introduction because it's good. So this is Herman's foreword uh, written there like last year. Karl Marx's critique of capitalism has received worldwide attention from those who want to overcome capitalism, but also from bourgeois intellectuals who don't like the critique of capitalism. Understandably, the bourgeois intellectuals are not interested in the alternative to capitalism. But how can it be explained that the alternative to capitalism, which can be derived from Marx's critique of capitalism, has not received any attention from the critics of capitalism? Why is the association of free and equal people that Marx and Engels sketched out in their critique of capitalism taken seriously, if at all, only as an idealistic picture of the future? Although Marx and Engels, with their reference to the calculation of working hours as the foundation for the relationship between the producer and the product, have themselves named the economic basis for the new production relationship and thus for the independent direct construction of the association of free and equal people. So how can it be explained that the first scientific elaboration of what Marx and Engels only hinted at in their critique of capitalism met with no interest among critics of capitalism. The explanation is very simple. The intellectuals critical of capitalism do not like the alternative that has been presented. Okay, so we're going to get into a description here now of all the different parties who don't take it seriously. One thing I would like to say, so let's, we talked about labour time planning, but Herman says it very succinctly here. Let, let's, let's read this little sentence here again. Their reference to the calculation of working hours as the foundation for the relationship between the producer and the product. Now, that's very, very important. So with our relationship as a producer under capitalism, as a worker under capitalism to the product, we get paged an exploitative rage and we have no control over the output. OK, our wage and what we get has been separated and alienated from the output. But under the measure that we're going to talk about here, the calculation of working hours, it intrinsically links your working hours, which is like and your consumption, the equivalent of the wage under capitalism, directly with your product. OK, now Marx goes into loads of detail how you can raise the rate of surplus value, et cetera, et cetera, uh, raise the rate of exploitation. So like your wage is one thing, but that is not linked to the product output. Like the product can be, I can get paid £10 an hour and I can produce £20, £30, £40, £50 an hour of output. Here though, 
with this relationship we're going to describe, how they are tightly bound and linked together and they're not alienated from each other. Okay, I think that's a, a very, very important point. Okay, let's let's talk about all these dudes who claim they're Marxists but don't like what Marx and Engels are talking about. Okay. For the communist parties fighting for the leading power, the idea is perfectly natural that the workers in the factories take over the power to hand it over to the intellectual vanguard so that the latter can then organise the new society in the name and for the good of the working class. The idea that the workers in the factories take over power in order to control their relationship from producer to product themselves based on the calculation of working hours without the need for privileged leadership does not fit in with their idea of a centrally structured economic and administrative apparatus. Okay, so this is this is essentially like what was well, this was essentially what the SPD was. Yeah, we're going to get into this in in in, in the book later on. We're going to see how the SPD actually evolved from actually wanting Marx and Engels' position to by 1900, I think, wanting to have this idea of the bureaucratic planners deciding all of production. And this is what we'll see that this is what the Bolsheviks were interested in. It's what Lenin was interested in. Like this is this was the this was the actual dominant position in the 1900s, early 1900s of the Marxist parties. It was a bureaucratic central statistics office planning a Goss plan. That that was actually the standard. Okay. And to this day, if people are on the Discord and they see me arguing with, with different people about this book, it's like that is still deep into the DNA of the workers' movement, Yeah, that we need a central bureaucratic element. You know, the idea that we're going to get to in this book is that a central idea is that like under capitalism, it's hugely decentralized. Yeah, and it's able to calculate outputs now. It's able to produce stuff. Now we've got problems with what it produces, absolutely. But it's able to do this decentralized action. And there is no reason why a socialist decentralized system based on a similar measure, because the measure we're going to use is so, so similar to the capitalist measure that there's no reason why it can't be decentralized. Okay, that there's not a calculation problem, something that we're going to really delve into later on. Okay, now let's let's have a look at these libertarian communists. But also, the libertarian communists do not like the economic basis of the association of, of free and equal people, as shown by Marx and Engels. They want to live in a communist society and at the same time be free from it. They dream of an immediate transition to a self-determined society of free and equal people according to the motto, from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs, for which every binding economic basis seems to them a contradiction. Like, I don't know what people think, like, so I don't know if we have, like, a lot of maybe anarchist people or left com type people. Illuminatus would like to speak. Yeah, jump in there, Julian. I feel like this is, like, your uh, random, like, anarchist person that you, like, meet somewhere who have, like, read very little and have uh, just, like, yeah, lifestyle anarchism, exactly. That's, uh, that's, what I meant. that's what I meant. Like, this is, like, the overall vibe I get from a lot of, like, non-theory leftist people. I wouldn't even be so harsh on people to say that it's non-theory because you just have to look at how much theory is written like this. Like the communizer stuff that I haven't read, but like people have sent me some stuff on it. And, you know, I know the general gist of what people, you know, where everything has to be spontaneous and it has to erupt in in a way. And like, you know, it's it's got to be like free and anarchic and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, yeah, we need a system that actually that actually can have that sense of freedom and, and anarchy that people can enjoy. But also we have to have a proper political economy that backs it up and just doesn't deteriorate. This is kind of, I think, a problem. Now, in this one, he calls them libertarian communists. OK, but I think today and probably at the time, maybe a lot of anarchists fall into this thing as well. Tiberius. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that the Libcom link to the the original pdf actually explicitly states that they don't agree with the formulation of a communist society based on money and they they have an alternative recommendation here a world without money which i thought was kind of interesting because 
the the concept of labor vouchers as money is that there's a there's that kind of sort of superficial resemblance to to what money is under capitalism but because of the way that it is sort of explicitly like hemmed in and like constrained in a way that money is not and it's it's disconnected from a lot of the the actual functions of like commodity or fiat money that are derived under like a capitalist mode of production. It's like fundamentally different at its core. And I think that, I think that a lot of what people are sort of reacting against when you're talking about labor vouchers as not being communist or like not leading to a communist society at the very least is that there's, there is a, there is a continuity between capitalism to uh, labor voucher socialism to to like an actual communist society that that I think is that, that I think a lot of the people who are sort of on the libertarian communist anarchist libsoc whatever it is kind of anti-capitalist left is that there is a link between well, we need to we need to have some kind of like transitionary period, and what we're going to do is we're going to set up this massive state bureaucracy that's going to essentially just be the capitalists. And and there's an there's an allergy there that comes from like an actual material play uh, historically material place. Yeah, I think one thing we're going to see again and again in the book, which is kind of to me is amazingly staggering like I, i'm being deeply moved by this book as in how often we see that there is a capitalist form and there is a mirror like communist socialist form but what's most important is that the content of the form is different so like what do i mean by that is like you look at a capitalist firm and you can you could have your revolution in the morning with the same machines okay and you have your socialist firm say, we would have run by a workers' council, whatever, okay? But the content of the social relations and how it operates is fundamentally different as to change entirely the basis of that society. And similarly with the money form, like in the, in the capitalism, we have this money form that at its base is built into the wage system and at its base, the, the exploitation wage is built into it. So exploitation is built into our, the money form. And when we have a labor, whatever, labor token society, whatever you want to call this other measure, like that in its very basis has basically surgically removed the exploitation out of the system. OK, and that people are, are, are looking at the forms and seeing similar forms. OK, and being afraid of the form. But really what we should be analyzing is the content of those forms. And understanding what it is about the content that changes money form under capitalism and a labor hours based measure under socialism. And like, I think that that to me is something that is so fundamental that hopefully we can try and get people to see why that is so important. Shannon. Yeah, I'm just curious if it's mentioned later on, but how are the labor hours therefore validated? Is this something like your manager will sign off and say, yeah, Shannon, Jim worked eight hours and I'm validating that. Like, would there be, how do we know this is going to be something that will be objectively measurable and fair and not something liable to, you know, corruption? Yeah, like, I think that that's a very fair comment. Like, uh, I personally see the technology today that's most amenable to actually recording all this stuff is some type of blockchain. OK, and it would be a, a blockchain that could be, I think, you know, authorized at different points. So what I mean by that is like who would have the ability to add new labor tokens into society? It would be at the point if you think about what the labor tokens are, it's supposed to represent work. OK, work being done by people. So at what point would who would we give the authority to create those things, it would be the people in their workplace. So a workers council in a factory, they would actually say like, you know, this guy clocked in at four and left at seven. He's done three hours, bang. We were going to credit him with three new labor tokens and so on and so forth. So I think the place at it would be actually would have to be at the point of work. At that point, you're getting into all the nitty gritty of how you would do it. But like no more than you do under capitalism. How does a firm decide how many hours people worked, blah, 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 blah. 
Okay, so I had another hand up there a second ago. Jared. So there's a lot of interesting theories around proof of work and how to how to go about that. A lot of that ties into blockchain today. So it's a it's a really tangible connection you're making there. Yeah, absolutely. Like that's that's Bitcoin, isn't it? Proof of work. You gotta do their little equation. I don't want to get too much into it here, but like what I would say, for example, if you think about like Say you had a revolution in the morning and you're trying to figure out, say, the hours in a factory now. Say uh, there's a shoe factory and they were producing shoes before the revolution and they're produ- going to be producing shoes after the revolution. And we're going to say, well, how many, how would we know what, like, if they're taking the mick or not? Well, it'd be reasonably easy. You just look at the accounts from that, their, their last reported accounts to the tax revenues. You would see the amount of labor hours. You would see their output. And so you would have ballparks to go from. And then you would have records, you see, going back through time. So you'd be able to tell if somebody was taking the mic or not. But don't want to go down that route too much. I can see Alex looking grim. Now, somebody put their hand up there again. Illuminatus, I think. I think the whole proof of work concept. So basically trying to evaluate whether actual useful work was done. I can imagine that this is like a hot topic today, like with big data algorithms to like watch your employees and whatever. But um, I think this is exactly not what they are doing here because they're not trying to measure what is actually accomplished by putting in the labor time, but they are trying to measure the labor time itself. So basically, when you're there and you're not like drastically slacking off, then that counts as labor time. Isn't that right? So if you want to think about it, it would be you have output. So you literally have a firm, a workers council, whatever, would have, say, we've done 10,000 hours of labor this week. We have 100,000 shoes. OK, and the proof of work is is the shoes. So they report their, their labor hours, but the proof of their labor is in the shoe. And if if society can see, well, those those hours are crazy, it shouldn't take that long to create that amount of shoes. Then society as a unit can get into deciding how what we're going to do about that situation. Donald? Yeah, I think it's uh, potentially even easier than that. So in the sense that this is the thing that maybe I didn't understand at the first passing, and it was only through talking to you that, that it kind of clicked with me, was that, you know, the plan for production is done before the production takes place. And there's an understanding from the material inputs to the production in terms of uh, fixed and circulating capital of exactly what the capacity of that plant is, you know, so if it's good or service, you know, you can tell from that in the sort of uh, transfer of value from the capital goods to the finished products, what the capacity is that that exists, you know, so it's not really possible to spoof the thing. And because you've given an undertaking in your little workers council or big one or whatever it is to have a certain level of output, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of built into the system that you are going to be working a certain amount of hours, you know, and then if you buy in new fixed capital, you can say uh, the amount of hours is now reduced that we would have to work for the same level of output, for example. So I think it's, yeah, I think it's kind of when you look at the thing in totality, you realize that there isn't really a way around it. You know, you you have to, uh, in order to have access to the goods that are going to be for sale uh, for or not for sale, but in order that are being uh, produced by society, uh, you have to, you know, complete as a group, as a unit, the the amount of of labor that's required for the production of of the goods that you're producing. So that's all I'd add. Yeah, that's a very well put, Donald. Like, as in, you know, the idea would be that a, a workers' council would say, "We have these machines, we have these amount of workers. You give us these raw materials and whatever we require, we will produce X number for you." And then they do it, and they record their hours as they're going along. And if they go crazy out of whack or under whack. You know, they'll have to like society will see that and they will have to be able to, you know, (laughs) deal with the consequences of things go badly wrong. You know, machines break down, society go, what's wrong? Machines broke down, grand. Oh, it's back now working away. Away we go. You know, but it's not like there isn't a regulating thing like profit regulates capitalism. But here our plan will regulate. Okay, I think I saw Julian jump up there as well beforehand. I just wanted to object to this notion that, oh, well, we can calculate what the output should be so good that we know if something fishy is going on. 
because this is just too complex. And this is basically what the Soviet Union tried and could do. And you could argue that maybe now it's possible because of computers and everything. But uh, when you read this for Swamp Side Chats, I think that was, this was also something that you discussed a lot. And I think what I just said, that it's kind of a nightmare vision to have basically Soviet Union, but workable with like total control via blockchain is uh, yeah, a pretty nightmarish, nightmarish scenario. No, I don't. I don't mean the blockchain as a controlling mechanism. I mean, the blockchain is the equivalent of a bank account where you store people's stuff. OK, and, it, it, you know, that's the level at which the blockchain is used. It's not a let, let's let's forget about it. we're getting down to all all the different roads of stuff here that we probably want to keep away at. But like, yeah, that's definitely not what I mean by a blockchain, as in some kind of thing that is working over society. The idea was literally to how how one would record people's uh, labor that they had done. Just like accounts under capitalism are how society under capitalism tries to detect fraud. That would be what I would say the, the mirror would be. Let's keep going with this because we're getting down uh, into the swampy nature of implementation and away from stuff. Alex wants to speak. Alex, have a quick chat there before we move on. Yeah, just move away from blockchain slightly. Can you just scroll back up a sec, Tom? Yeah. Did Marx or Engels ever recommend that accounting should be done in terms of hours of work? Yes. Or they just, they did? Yeah. yeah. Uh, they did in Capital Volume 1. He talked about Robinson Crusoe. And he talked about how Robinson Crusoe plans his day and then how a, another, a, like a communist society could plan their day based on living hours. He also does it in the critique of the Gotha program and I think in anti-during as well. Okay. Yeah, like I think there's about a page and a half of it in chapter, in volume one, um, where he gets into the it's into uh, this. Right, I, I must have missed it. I thought they were just maybe claiming it was an obvious consequence, but I, I didn't realize it actually written it. Yeah, no, yeah, like I think the place where it's been most clearly expanded was in the Gotha critique of the Gotha program. Okay, right. I'll yeah, check. but it's definitely there in Capital Volume One. I was surprised when I rewrite Capital; I didn't remember it being there, but it, yeah, it is there. Okay, let's keep going here. We're nearly out of the, <laughs> the introductions. The party communists rely on the dictatorship over the proletariat on whose distant horizon freedom appears after the realm of necessity had been overcome under the leadership of the party through the long and complicated path of the development of the productive forces. The libertarian communists rely on the socialist morality freely hovering above this economy in order to establish the realm of freedom in the realm of necessity without the measure of the calculation of working hours, which according to Marx is the unavoidable measure while the attempts of state communism with the dictatorship over the proletariat ended in a return to capitalism, in 1936 in Spain, the attempt of libertarian communists ended in economic chaos in which the libertarian communists themselves sought their salvation in forms of central allocation. The fundamental principles of communist production and distribution are the last message what the revolutionary movements of the first half of the 20th century have left to us. That's by Henk Kahnemeyer. He was like a, a big councillor. I think he's a Dutch guy. They show the economic basis on which exploitation can be abolished and communist society realised without sinking into chaos and without reducing communist society to an ideal on the distant horizon of, of human history. In this sense, the German translation of the second completely revised and expanded edition of the fundamental principles is at the same time a fundamental critique of the various theories and also of the practices of the various currents that refer to Marxism, anarchism, or more generally socialism. A critique that has lost none of its original topicality to this day, or in the words of the GIC themselves, there is no point in discussing federalism or centralism if you don't first show what the economic basis of this federalism or this centralism will be. In reality, the forms of organisation of a given economy are not on the whole arbitrary forms. They are derived from the principles of that economy itself. Therefore, it is insufficient to present the economy of communism only as a negation of the capitalist system. No money, no market, no private or state property. It is necessary to present its positive characters, to show what the economic laws will be, 
that will triumph over those of capitalism. If one proceeds in this way, it is very likely that the alternative federalism or centralism appears to be the wrong question. Comments. Comments. Anybody. Anybody. Okay. Okay. Tiberius. Tiberius. It's just a quick note, but I, I kind of wanted to say that I, I do like that a lot more people are talking about like no private or public property, private or state property. It's it's kind of a it's kind of a bugbear of mine that's that's only tangentially related, but I, I think that incorporating the idea of like a commons or common property that is managed by the people who worked it overseen by the people who rely on it is is a much clearer way to think about property relations under a communist society and uh chris i just wanted to say there's a uh, marx has a little i presents a, i guess a little sketch of uh socialized production in volume two as well just for reference if you go to um Anyone here? If you go to, uh, I think it's section three, chapter 18, um, on the basis of socialized production is how it starts. I, I just wanted to add that. Cool. Yeah. Just every so often you get like, there's a page where Marx is talking about something incredibly boring. And then all of a sudden he'll just start like talking about communism for like 20 lines and then go back to like, and now if you look at sector section sector one <laughs> moves its production into sector two and you're like oh my god help me help me jesus uh yeah no thanks for that chris getting back to what tiberius said yeah i think the fundamental way when i read this book and the way i understand this is that i feel as if like everything in the society apart from your own personal stuff is like it, the idea is more like guardianship if, if that's what you mean by commons, like, you know, the, the workers council don't own the means of production, nor do they own the factory, but they're guardians of it. And I think that's the basis on which stuff should be run. OK, any more comments on that before we head into chapter one? OK, we're good. Let's hit chapter one. Does anybody want to try reading a section? Has anybody got a good speaking voice that they're confident to do it and a good Internet connection? I don't know if I've got a good speaking voice. I'm happy to read about you on Tom. So, the starting point of the fundamental principles of communist production and distribution. A, the workers' councils as the organisational basis. In our paper, The Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution, the implementation of communism is seen from a completely different side than has been customary in the labour movement until now. In part, the course of the Russian Revolution is the cause, which put the need for a closer examination of the problems of communist economic life on the agenda. A further reason for the need for further investigation is the new position of agricultural problems. In our paper, Lines of Development in Agriculture, we've shown that agricultural production is completely socialised, that the farm has changed over to industrial production, but that nevertheless, the agricultural question remains the big obstacle, making it impossible to carry out the socialism or communism of the common view. The farm cannot be integrated organically into the communist economy. We conclude from this that then the entire understanding of this communism must be wrong. The third and probably the most important reason why an examination of the problems of communist production became necessary was that the working class used different forms of organisation in the revolution than in the period of quiet improvement of working conditions. The organisational structure of the revolutionary workers' movement finds manifestation factory organizations and workers councils okay so there's there's three kind of major points here like w- one of the points that we're going to discuss later on in this book is the agricultural sector and the peasants as marxists like to call them you know <laughs> it's coming from kind of peasant stock i never really like the word peasant <laughs> i prefer farmer peasant always makes it feel really like you're a dunce so we lay out in the later chapters here. Let me see what chapters. There is chapters on the introduction of communism and agriculture, where you know one of the one of the major problems they thought like in the early twentieth century that why communism won't work because of those those infer- nefarious backward peasants. And I think like they lay out a good uh, analysis of the peasantry and show how they're a mixture of, of stuff and they're not really the impediment. 
and I think the analysis is really quite good. I think like the you know the impediment to it was the failures of of the proletariat organizations and the socialist organizations more so than like nefarious peasants. I think looking from from the history of it, maybe other people will disagree with me. So he he's he's saying that like basically there has to be something fundamentally wrong with what is the common view of communists about the the peasantry. What does he say here? The, the understanding of this communism must be wrong. And I think that's correct. Now, I had uh, somebody, uh, Bobson Dugnut, raise a hand. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I just had a quick question because I know that the, the farmers in Russia were a huge problem in a couple of ways. But what I don't really understand is that there were like a form of collective farm before the revolution. And then, of course, later there were experiments in collective farms after and I know that in other parts of the world, like Latin America, they also have collective farms. So I'm not completely sure. Like, I like what this book does to basically say there are ways of getting around this problem. But I, I'm not sure I understand how, the, how it's always the case that agricultural production is outside of this, you know? See, I don't think they're even making the case that agriculture is outside of it. You know, I think they're making the case that agricultural production, like much like the workers are guardians of the factories, there is no reason why a communist society cannot view the farm, in essence, as some kind of a factory, as in the farmer is the guardian of the farm for society and he gets paid on his labor also. They make the case, you know, that they doubly make the case later on that the farmers are have been integrated and industrialized. So farmers are sheep farmers or they're hay or they're wheat farmers or they're alpaca farmers. They're not people who are self-sufficient and live off the land anymore. That's like that's gone. You know, my, my grandparents were self-sufficient farmers, essentially, but not really producing for the market too much. But, you know, all the farmers, you, you can't live on your own farm. You know, very, very few do. So the fact that they are the farms are being introduced into this un- industrialized farming means that they are fully producing for the market. They're not self-sufficient. And at that point, they need their raw materials and they need their tractors and they need their stuff too. So if they want to be able to actually continue their industrial farming practice, they have to integrate themselves into this dictatorship of the proletariat. You know, there are obvious benefits as well for farmers if you look at it like they, they don't have the debt they're not in hock to the banks. They're guaranteed an income. So there's there's lots of reasons why farmers might actually do well out of a thing that's done right. So I, I think that's the kind of basis where they're trying to, to come from, that the farm should be seen much like a small business would operate under a communist society, say. That was my understanding of it. Again, here he talks about how Russia, the Russian Revolution is what put the need for a closer examination of communist economic life on the on the agenda. So we're seeing this like, you know, these things are are popping out of, you know, the material real conditions. Like this book is not something or the the cancel communist movement or their their ideas on on the wage labor and abolishing wage labor. They're not coming out of pie in the sky ideas. They're not coming down from, you know, an altar or the tablets from Moses. They're coming out of the the practical experience of the revolution. Not only that, but also that the the revolutionary period, he makes the case here that the revolutionary period, the factory organizations and the workers' councils came out of the revolutionary period. Okay, they didn't come out of, you know, the slow improvement in, in union wages, say. Alex, how do you feel about going again? Okay. Between the organizational structure of a movement and the ideologies, the world of thought through which it is carried, however, is a close association. This connection is so intimate that the structure can be called a function of its ideologies. The organizational structure of the various currents in the workers' movement then runs parallel to the various views we encounter on the construction of communist society. If we also see structural changes in the class struggle, then this indicates that important ideological transformations have taken place, which are now finding their organizational expression. In revolutionary periods, important ideological transformations take place at unprecedented speed. The goal of the workers becomes completely different, completely radicalized. 
one of the most important lessons that the revolutionary period of 1917 to 23 brought us is probably that the transformed ideologies have a different organizational expression than the old workers' movement. Most violently, even in a bloody struggle, the old workers' movement is opposed because it opposes the newly formed world of thought of the radicalized workers. The factory organizations and workers' councils are the organizational weapons with which the workers carry out the revolution. Yeah, so this is some deep stuff here. What do you make of this, Alex? Um, I mean, it, it all seems a, a valid point. I'm still waiting to see how he ties it to so we need to count work in terms of uh, hours of work. I'm still yet to see what the problem the, 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 the book is trying to fix. I mean, maybe that, that comes along later. Yeah, yeah, like that's we will we'll definitely be coming along later. But yeah, like I think he's he's trying here to make this trying to make this link. You know, he he doesn't want this book to be like something that like Marx would critique as social utopianism. This is fundamental to what he's talking about here. He doesn't want people to think like, oh, I have the plan, lads. Let's do the plan. OK, if we all just could cohere on this plan, he's making more the point that like the revolution itself, the, the structure of the organizations that came out suggest the very kind of political economy that's coming out of it. And, and more so that the political economy that came out of the revolution itself led people to talk about the political economy that we would actually have to implement for a communist society to work. That the way, like the, the amazing thing that the first book is written, I think in 1923, and it lays out essentially a hundred years of Russian history ahead of it, based on the misunderstanding of how to implement socialism. Okay. And so he's trying to link what we're going to talk about here in a material fashion and to try and get away from this as utopianism. Like I think this idea of of ideology and this interlinking between you know organizational structure and ideologies with you know your your day to day material life and your political life, you know I think is a very deep insight, particularly with organizational structure. We see that the organizational structure of say what worked for Lenin and the Bolsheviks in in Russia already we have seen like. In the communist Marxist movement, things being changed by by the by the course of history. Right. Okay. I'll read this bit here. The importance attached to the idea of councils at the beginning of the revolutionary period can be seen, for example, from an overview by D. J. Struik in *De Neue Tide*. I presume that's like the Dutch for the new tide. Somebody check that out for me. <laughs> I presume it is *De Neue Tide* or oh, *New Times*. Okay, the *De Neue Tide* is *New Times*. Dutch and English are ridiculously similar, but you just have to kind of use a lot of phlegm when you're speaking Dutch. Die neue Zeit. There we go. From the resolution on the councils adopted by the KPH at that time. I presume that's the Communist Party of Holland. It says there, Nothing shows more clearly the progress we have made in recognising the laws of social revolution than our explanation of the council system. Even two years ago, that declaration was still utterly impossible. This was written in 1919. And three years ago, even the brightest minds of the international could say almost nothing about the significance of the councils as we see them now. It would be difficult to find expressions in this spirit in pre-war literature. Everywhere until the February Revolution of 1917, it remains a simple announcement of the necessary change in the political and economic forms in which the revolution was to be wrapped. As far as we know, no further indications have been made, at least on not this side of the Vistula. Rosa Luxemburg writes causally only once in her entire brochure on the mass strike about the 1905 Council of Workers' Delegates. Trotsky deals in detail with the history, significance and power of this first council in his book on the first Russian Revolution. Still, he does not delve into an investigation of the council system itself. And even in the Marxist writings that appeared during the first half of the World War, in Verboten, Lichtstrahlen, etc., there is no reference to the Petrograd Soviet of 1905. The fact that shortly after the outbreak of the February Revolution of 1917, the Soviet idea began to have such a firm foundation is exclusively a consequence of the practice of the revolution. 
if ever Mehring's word that the intuition of the great of the acting masses can be more ingenious than the greatest genius is true, it is in this case. The most important and most positive thing that the revolutionary period of 1917 to 23 has brought us is that we've seen the forms in which the proletarian revolution takes place, while at the same time the ideologies appeared, the expression of which are the new forms. The takeover of the social productive apparatus is carried out by the factory organisations and their unification, the workers' councils. Therefore, an examination of the problems of communist production and distribution must start from this basis. So he's hammering, again, hammering this point that it's coming out of the material conditions and the practice, that these revolutionary forms of the workers' councils have sprung into being. And it's this that should be the basis for our understanding of, of communism. Like he's really trying to hammer it home that this is not social utopianism. Anybody now want to dis- talk about that? Anybody got a hand up? Alex. Is he being a little fair on Rosa Luxemburg? I mean, I've just been reading some of her stuff and it's had dry, but a common theme does seem to be that, you know, the hope lies in the self-organisation of the, the workers, even if she doesn't, you know, expect that organisation, what form that organisation is going to take. Yeah, I think his critique is more that she, like, of, say, like, the actual, the form itself, the workers' councils, you know, as in that's the specific form. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't read any Lux- Luxembourg, so I can't comment. But I, I, I do think that he's just saying that, like, you know, all, all of the best minds didn't see what this actual form, how important it was going to be. Yes. Um, I mean, well, why would the form after the 1917 revolution be the same as the form after 1905? Uh, so, so say, say that again, Alex, what do you mean? I mean, why would the form after the 1917 revolution be the same as the form it took in... The, the 1905 Council of Workers delegates. Well, I think like the, he's saying that like the form was there in 1905, but people missed the strategic or the, the actual importance of that form. And then actually in the revolutions of, you know, the German revolution as well, the workers' councils. And apparently like this is the case is that the there wasn't that, I don't know, I think it's in the book here. They say that the German workers weren't even aware of the, the importance of the Soviets in Russia, they they weren't aware of that, and like that, but the same form itself actually sprung into existence all over the country. That it's something in that form that's particularly important that most of the Marxist prior didn't even recognize the the importance of it. Anybody have anything to say? Illuminatist Julian. So forming councils is basically what people generally do in a crisis situation. Like, even if there's, like, a disaster and, like, the state aid isn't sufficient or whatever, you basically just people get together and say, okay, what can we do about it? Let's organize ourselves. Of course, it has, like, strategic importance, like, worker councils have strategic importance because that's just what will happen in a revolutionary situation. But that doesn't mean it's, like, the necessarily it doesn't follow from that that this is necessarily like the be all and end all of how a communist society will be organized because it's basically just what people always do in a crisis situation i would also say though with respect to that though that it's not that they're just kind of committees like where are the committees they were workers committees in workers factories that's a that's a different thing than saying just like a committee to handle this or that. It was the fact that they had workers' councils at the at the points of production or say in the army as well, you know, points of army production, if you want to call it a kind of a, a dumbass name like that. But it, it's more so than they just organized. It's that it was like at a at a factory, a council, workers' council basis. And I, I do think though that it, like if we think about the idea of socialism that like to me is the deepest description of it like something that Chomsky says is like the the workers in uh, have control of the means of production and what like what does that mean in practice to me that's a workers council you know the people who are act directly involved in the running of the day-to-day means of production would have to be councils of people at the point of operation as opposed to you know just a, a regional one like a street one so because of the organizational breakdown in the crisis situation 
it is like easier to have local councils than like higher regional councils or whatever. So the the building of councils will always start at the base. So n nobody cares if some like peasants in like a remote village like put their heads together. But obviously, if like in the crisis situation, like the average Joes are like, okay, let's uh, talk how we get out of this or what to do. You will have workers and soldiers because like who else is there in the mass of people who could meaningfully self-organize? Like you won't get like a council of city administrators because if they could meaningfully direct everything, you wouldn't be in a crisis situation after all. So, so that's why I think that this forming of councils is just like a general crisis response. I, I think that's fair, but I, yeah, I, I would also say that the the step from understanding workers' councils are important for communism and getting to a situation where you have all the layers of abstraction above from the basic firm that are also councils and all of that apparatus that would need to be built and socially built is not a thing that we're going to get out of this book. And it's kind of skipped over in its entirety. I think in one place it will it will talk about economic congresses, which hints at a higher level of organization. But it's not something we're going to we're get here. And I take that point yeah very much so like in the revolution you're not going to get all the levels of complexity up or you might find maybe you can but it, it will be difficult to implement that it's like implementing an entire new straight structure in the middle of a revolution is something that's a gin ginormous hole and problem in what we're going to talk about here in this book tiberius i think had something to say uh yeah i, I just wanted to point out that the the fact that when systems of like hierarchy breakdown, what you get are sort of like these spontaneous councils of people who are directly involved in whatever it is that needs to be done that isn't being sort of dictated to from, from on high is, is like the council form, then I think that that points to not necessarily councils being the end all and be all, but like these kinds of councils, especially at key points of like production, distribution, that kind of thing, are, are sort of like the natural basis upon which to form up these more complex societal structures that don't reincorporate the, the same kind of like dominance and power structures that basically quash them from existing in the first place. So I, I think I, I think it is I take your point, Julian, that this is something that crops up again and again. But I, I would push back to say that because they crop up again and again, because they're such seemingly like a natural part of the way that human beings respond to things that need to happen that aren't being controlled anymore, but still have to go on. Like, I, I think that that points to them being an incredibly important starting point, even if that's not where the the ultimate end goal is. Okay, Alan wants to say something. I was volunteering to read if you need a break. All right, Marxist explanation of the domination of the working class. In addition to the factory organization, the second starting point for the fundamental principles of communist economic life is the Marxist explanation of the domination and exploitation of the working class in a capitalist society. It is not primarily an interpretation of Marx quotations, but rather the general train of thought, the essence of his analysis. Domination and exploitation are extraordinarily simple in their causes and immediately comprehensible for everyone. They are enclosed in the fact that the worker is separated from the means of production. The capitalist is the owner of the means of production. The worker owns only his labor force. The capitalist owns the conditions under which the worker must work. Thus, the worker is economically completely without rights, even if political democracy is carried out to the extreme. He is dependent on capital. With the right of disposal over the means of production, the possessing class also has the disposal over the labor force. That is, it rules the working class. The right of disposal over the means of production exercised by the ruling class brings the working class into a relationship of dependence on capital. That is the essence. 
The fact that the working class is separated from the means of production implies that it does not dispose of the finished product. The workers have nothing to do with the goods produced by them. They do not belong to them, but to their employers. What further happens with them is not their business. They only have to sell their labor force and receive their wage in return. They are wage laborers. That cannot be otherwise. The disposition of the production apparatus includes the disposition of the finished product. They are two different sides of the same thing. They are functionally dependent, and one is not without the other. One exists only through the other. Because the workers do not have the disposal of the production apparatus, therefore they also do not have disposal of the finished product. Thereby they are dominated. Thereby they are wage laborers. Wage labor is the expression of the fact that the work is separated from the work products. The fact that the workers have no say about the product nor about the production apparatus. Wage labor is the unmistakable sign of the immaturity of the working class, of its domination by those who dispose of the social production apparatus and the social product. As simple as the basis for the domination of the working class is, as simple as the formulation for the abolition of wage slavery, even if the practical implementation is not so simple, this abolition can only consist in the abolition of the separation of work and the work product, that the right of disposal over the work product, and therefore also over the means of production, is again given to the workers. That is the essence of communist production. Like, this is the essentially distilled argument of the entire book. You know, this is, the reason the book is like, you know, people say like, Marx didn't write a book about communism or socialism, he wrote a book about capitalism. Like, this is called The Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution. And this is the reason why that is the title for the book. He didn't say the fundamental economic basis of communism. Distinctly, what they're getting to is that when you have the wage labor, that is a, an, an indication that the workers do not control the means of production. Because if they control the means of production, they would actually control the output of production. And because they don't control the output of production, they get a wage. And it's this key core fundamental point that wage labor has to be abolished if you're going to get to communist production, where the workers have full right of disposal over their product. That is the basis of using labor time accounting. Like to me, this is, a, this is like the entire book crunched into like a couple of paragraphs. Now, what, what do people think? Bob St. Donut. <laughs> yeah, I know. I really, really like this whole passage. It kind of reminds me of when I first read Capital, except... This is perhaps more concise, so it kind of reminds me of Engels explaining something that Marx said, except I feel like this builds on but is separate from capital, you know, but like I found this to be very clarifying for me. Yeah, me too. Like, I, I think it's it's like a, a zip file of like one sentence or something Marx probably said somewhere. You know, he's unzipped it. <laughs> and, you know, like, because it is... Exactly. It, it's it's right there in the like in the idea of the labor time planning, but it, this is so ridiculously clear and, and well and well written. Any, anybody else have any comments? Alan S. Not exactly a disagreement, but I might want to point out that this is framed in terms of right of disposal over the work product, and I think this is implied, but it might be worth just making it more explicit that we also need to like keep in mind the, I guess you could call it like control over the work process and not just the end result, not just the product. Cause like, I guess it, it would be easy to misinterpret uh, something like, well, what if, if we have a bunch of uh, worker co-ops, but you know, still more or less with a, a value form and, and capitalist style production, but Hey, they're worker cooperatives maybe in competition with each other. So in a sense, they have some right of disposal over their product, but there would still be an kind of exploitative aspect to it that's dominating their work process. So, yeah, like I think it, so what's most important as well, I would say, like, it's a very good point is like that you, we need to show that the value form is not going to sneak its dodgy head back in Why the measure and the way the measure is implemented. So absolutely. Like deep into the core of this is the idea of how the different councils under a same, what does he call them, a guild, aren't competing against each other. So absolutely, if we had an idea where the it was a worker co-ops, even with labor time planning, and they were competing 
uh, the way that it would operate. The labor, the value form would rear its ugly head uh, again. And also, I think you're dead right about the process, even even abstracting from that. And say you do have the right labor time planning and, uh, you know, the way the, the guilds and the councils operate, you know, still want to say that like the, the process itself, it's no good everybody just getting the fair share if the actual conditions in the workplace are still being decided by a management, even if they're getting the same wages as you. Like that, it it has to be democratic to its core. You could imagine a a very egalitarian, bureaucratic, workers' councils, (laughs) communist system, you know, that would not include the labour process in there. But I, I, yeah, I think, I think the process is very important, actually, because, you know, it's certainly something that was entirely lacking in most socialist experiments of the 20th century. Yeah, I was, I was just going to point out that this is, this is a very nice sort of distillation of the argument of the book, but that, like, the reason why the labor chits, labor tokens, whatever they are, are not a wage is not really obvious from from what has been said so far and requires a lot more explication and so I, was, I wanted to say that but you guys basically covered that already so it, it, it's very true like so we're going to get into the basis of why why it is that it combines the distribution of the production together in a kind of a unity and a whole that's something that we're, we're going to get to but we, you know, we don't get it from this, no matter how nicely distilled this is, we're getting at that kind of core contradiction in the wage labor thing. We're not getting its uh, full unzipped file. There's still some unzipping here left to do. Okay, Julian. This uh, paragraph actually is on the cover, at least uh, for the German edition that I got, that I've got. Yes, it's on it. It's on the English one as well. I think Alex wanted to say something. Yeah, uh, I'm just wondering, why is the right of disposal so important uh, to them? So I, mean, I, I could imagine, you know, I'm working, I'm getting paid for my hours, that's all fine. Why does control over how it's dis- disposed matter to me? Because I, I'm thinking of situations where, you know, the state is the only purchaser of a certain product. I think it used to be the case in the UK that only the state bought milk from farms. I can imagine, like, the state being the only buyer of, of steel, say, for, for example. Why would I want the right of potentially a scarce product to be able to, to deny the state that's and I know I found someone will pay more for it mate. yeah I don't think they're saying like you know in some of this kind of Marxist speak it's it's said in this kind of flowery general kind of a way as opposed to a specific way so they're, they're not kind of making the point that I'm working in a shoe factory and when the shoe is done the shoes are they're my shoes you know, like, so what they're making the case for is that society as a whole, that the, the laborers in general have control over the disposal of of their products. Now, those products will go to a distribution channel. They'll go to Walmart, whatever, call me Amazon or whatever it is in the future. But like your wage, literally the labor that you've done will be represented by the product of your output. OK, and you are allowed to consume that amount of product, whether it is that shoes or something else. You say you want to consume just your own shoes. Yeah, right. When you create those shoes, your wage is those shoes. They are your shoes. OK, that's so there's a one to one mapping between your wage and your output. OK, so that there is not like an alienation between the worker and the output. It's like there's a one to one mapping between their consumption thing and their product of output. So it's it's kind of more in a, a systemic way of talking about it, but yeah. So it's it's not like the, the that worker. Those are my shoes. I I don't know if that's cleared it up for you. It, it might become clearer as well as we read on. Yeah, like the alternative it would be Alex is that like I get a, a wage. I get like in capitalism, I get half the pay, right? So the product that I've just done, right? I don't even have control over the amount of that product. Yeah. Now, if I was to actually buy half of those shoes, some of that some of that product is being disposed of by somebody else. It's taken away from me. There's not a unity between me and my output. Does that right. make sense? Yeah. yeah. Like, so, you know, that's kind of what they're getting towards, that the, the, the workers as a whole have the right of disposal over all the work of the workers, that there is not a capitalist class saying we have right of disposal over 50% of your output. Sure. And that's the sense. But there would, you would expect some controlling body to say, okay, 
we need roads, we need hospitals, we need defence, whatever. So a certain percentage of your stuff will be taken for building up infrastructure. Oh yeah, well we're going to get there. We're going to get to the comic, the comic tax, the FIC, the factor of individual consumption. <laughs> okay, right. down the line, we're going to get there. We got some formulas and everything for all those math sure. cards. You know, first we're going to, going to really hone in on the fundamental political economy of of this. So the essence of communist production, let me do a bit of a read here. Okay. Of course, this can no longer be done in the way that the craftsman used to have his tools and work product at his disposal. Today, society does not know any more individual work on its own. It has gone over to social production, to the socialized work process, where everyone is only a cog in the big hole. That is why the workers must now possess the means of production collectively. But common possession, which does not at the same time include the right of disposal over it, misses the purpose. Common ownership is not an end in itself. It is only the means to make possible the right of disposal over the means of production for the workers to abolish the separation of work and product of labour to abolish wage labour. Let me read that sentence again. Common ownership is not an end in itself. It is only the means to make possible the right of disposal over the means of production for the workers to abolish the separation of work and product of labour to abolish wage labour. Okay, like, so this is really super, 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 super important. Like, how many Marxists today do you hear, like, you know, they'll say things, oh, we've got to nationalise the Bank of England, or nationalise the banks, and we've got to do this and that and the other. And it, it's nearly entirely, look look at the Jeremy Corbyn labour proposal, all that. It was nationalise the rails, nationalise this, nationalise that. Now, they had some ideas of having some kind of citizenship involvement. But again, it's not it it was it would be in reality something that is decided upon by a bureaucracy. Okay, and once a bureaucracy is deciding on what happens to the output, the workers are not in control of the output. So like the idea being that the reason why we collectivize everything is so that we can put the workers into control of their own means of production an end of wage labour and have a direct link to the product and the, the, the production and the distribution. Okay. And that it's like, well, what we actually saw in 20th century socialism is the state nationalising and the state deciding what is going to be done with the actual output. And, you know, look at the Soviet Union. They wanted to industrialise. What happened? They had to exploit. They had to have a rate of exploitation. Now, somebody has raised a hand. Who is that? I missed it. Okay, Julian, yep, far ahead. But the right of disposal, we just uh, talked about how this is not direct. So like you can ho- hoard all the shoes uh, you produce, but it's mediated societal process of like the workers as a whole. So where exactly do you make a hard cut from, okay, this is just like the societally mediated disposal of the means of production to this is a, like a stifling bureaucracy because it's a, it seems to me that it's like a basically a gradient and somewhere in there you've got like a from quantity to quality shift or whatever <laughs> like if you, if, as we get further into it, we, we we look at how actually in practice the planning of socialist states operated like they made top down decisions about what is the necessary requirements for uh, survival, how many calories this, how much they should get of that. They also had like, you know, highly differential wages between specialists and non-specialists and bureaucrats and non-bureaucrats and workers. So we they actually explicitly implemented exploitation at root, that people's, their consumption wasn't linked to their amount of production. So that we're going to get into into that, but like there is definitely a shift into quality from quantity. But the, the most important thing here is that there is no shift into quantity as well to get quality different. No matter where you work in any organization, you can only get your labor time payment. You can't get more than your labor time payment. So the actual capability of exploitation goes out the window and how collectively decisions are made 
of course, will change it. Like no, no one organization is, would have the power themselves to push people around, uh, but only society kind of like as a whole, as a part, as opposed to a bureaucracy and elite. He doesn't get into the nitty gritty. He assumes a layer of democratic institutions, but not bureaucratic institutions making decisions above the heads of the people. Last bit here. Let's see. Here we go. Who who read? Was it Alan? Did you read? Do you, Do you want, want to take, take the, the, the final bit? bit? Sure. Confusion of goal and means. This is the weak point of today's labor movement. The aim is to bring the means of production into common ownership, and they do not suspect that this cannot be the goal at all. They do not suspect that the transition to common ownership only poses the problem of a new mode of production. The working class wrongly lives in the confidence that communism must come by itself when private ownership of means of production is abolished. But the assumption that in doing so, wage labor must necessarily disappear is wrong. The real proletarian goal can only be for the workers to conquer the right of disposal over the means of production and thus over the product, and thereby indeed abolish wage labor. Only then will the working class become free. The common disposition of production by free producers is the basis of communist society. The free producers, however, cannot arbitrarily dispose of the means of production as the free producers in capitalism, the factory owners or leaders do. If the disposal is arbitrary, then there can be no question of common disposal. The first condition to make common disposal of the production apparatus possible is therefore that the production takes place according to generally established rules, rules on which all social work must rest. Only then can joint decision-making and action be achieved. The independent producers must therefore create equal production rules for all producers. Thus, the free producers at the same time become equal producers. The operational organizations thus embody in their connections of the most varied kind, the association of free and equal producers. Let's just have a look at this line. They do not suspect that the transition to common ownership only poses the problem of a new mode of production. What do people think he's getting at there? Like to me, that just absolutely kind of screams out at people actually beginning in this time like i don't know if this is in the first edition but like it's true that what was being done in 1923 in the first edition that people were actually actually analyzing the problems of the the soviet mode of production that the actual getting things into common ownership that actually launched a whole load of kind of theoretical insights into the problems of just doing that I think that's kind of a deep point, to be honest with you. A whole new political economy, like people are still arguing today. Like how many Swamp Side Chats episode has there been on? Like, was the Soviet Union a bureaucratic dictatorship or was it a non-mode of production? How many socialist theory podcasts have there been on that topic alone? God knows how many I've listened to. How many books have been written on? Was it state capitalist? Was it, you know... Let's have a little reread of this section here. Okay, so he's getting deep into this idea of what you were kind of talking a bit before, uh, Tiberius, like that, this idea of kind of like guardianship. Okay, the free producers, however, cannot arbitrarily dispose of the means of production. Like, a problem you had in the Soviet Union in early revolutionary period times, I think what happened a lot of times is that the workers' councils, they just sold the, they sold the equipment and the raw materials off. They literally, they sold the machines and then they uh, went and they got the money for it and went home and they bought a farm. Like, literally, that was a problem. And so what they're trying to get you here is that, like, the workers' council, who has control over the means of production in their, in their factory, they don't own that stuff. If the disposal is arbitrary, there can be no question of common disposal. So this is a very important point. I think that's also a critique of, say, the anarchist stuff in Spain. I think that's a critique of that. Because they had the idea, the syndicalists, I think, had the idea of like, you know, factories, a car factory would like have disposal, right of disposal over their cars and bargain with other people to sell it to. That like you could have workers in key industries having the right of disposal and not society as a right of disposal. So I think that's also a kind of comment against the syndicalists. Okay, the independent producers must therefore create equal production rules for all producers. 
Thus, the producers at the same time become equal producers. So what he's getting to here is like this idea of like a common legal basis for the communist society. I think that's kind of like the way that private property is the kind of root basis for the legal system in bourgeois capitalist system. We're going to talk here. He's making this case for like these equal production rules being like one of the kind of the base kind of legal basis for the entire operation of society. Do are people understanding on that the same way as me? Or are they understanding that differently? Alex? Uh, yeah, I wanted to, to be that. I mean, that, that sentence is doing a lot of work, isn't it? I mean, so what are the equal production rules between coal miners and architects, for example? It's a bit like, ta-da, uh, you know, uh, the dust they produce become equal producers. How? So the point I think that he's making there is that because you can only get paid your, your labour hours and society owns the product and the means of production, that it does not matter whether you're a coal miner working your 40 or your 20 hours a week in the coal mine, your labor will get you the same disposal over your consumption goods as the architect who's working 20 hours in the office. And that the, the architect doesn't own the prints or the office, but society owns them all. So therefore, there's equal production rules for the miner and the architect. So the, the product, you, while well, you're entitled to exactly the a non-exploitative amount of your product, the product itself and the means of subsistence or the means of production itself, you don't own them. And I think that's the common basis. Okay. Donal. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. And I think it's worth kind of tying that back to the fact that in the absence of exploitation or uh, a price policy that kind of would disrupt that, what the labor tokens do is perform the function of money in having a sort of common unit of account that then allows for an exchange of equivalents that not only you know exchanges equivalents in terms of what is produced by society that you can get for your labor tokens kind of what you put in in labor but also it it also reflects the remuneration you know so it's not only the goods but also your own and that's obviously abstracting away the deductions that have to be taken but you'll get onto that a bit later i guess uh, with the FIC yeah that's that's precisely correct that's that's exactly it. Uh, Alan, do you want to read the last paragraph and we're done? Sure. Seen from this point of view, therefore, the demand for equality does not appear to be an ethical or a moral one at all, but rather arises from the necessary production conditions of communist economic life. Here, equality is not an ethical term, but an economic one. It wants to express nothing other than that production in all business organizations proceeds according to the same rules in order to make possible a common disposition of the production apparatus. To make these rules binding for the whole production is the essential task of a proletarian revolution. So we see how the moral demand of equality that we put on communism, the demand of the same conditions for the development of individuality, finds its foundation in the equality in production. What do you make of that? Um... So I guess uh, it's kind of uh, a rebuttal a little bit of, I'm, I'm thinking of a critique of Gotha program when Marx was going in on that social democratic concept of equality. It, this seems like a kind of refutation of that version of equality and trying to frame it more in terms of the objective conditions of production rather than some kind of uh, an abstract spiritual demand or trying to say that specific individual humans are equal to each other the way that Marx was kind of going against in, in the critique. Yeah, like, and you know, it's one thing I think that when we read the Marxist literature, everybody's trying to get away from moralism or <laughs> nearly an ethics. And, you know, I do think you know, the idea of putting forward this actual, you know, communism it is a kind of a normative thing. You know, we're kind of saying capitalism bad, communism good woo you know so i there is a kind of way where we want to kind of get away from it being could we not just not get along could we not just you know why can't we just get on you know so you're trying to root the political economy in a way whereby this notion of equality that you know it's it's not saying that everybody will have the same wage uh, or same same consumption levels because if you don't work different amounts you won't get the same stuff but that everything is based on this this 
fundamental political economic political economy that leads that the equality and the egalitarianism comes out of it. I think that's I don't know if I'm butchering that. Chris wanted to say something. Yeah, and I think we got to remember too that we're part part of it is um, we're not looking at degrees in labor. You know, we have these labor aristocrats and whatever. We're, like going on uh, the Gotha program, we're, we're kind of hoping that there's a, a leveling of the distinction between a mental and physical labor, right? You know, thinking of, is there any reason an engineer can't also be a millwright? You know, you designed a thing, maybe you should go install it yourself, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then just general social chores too. And I think if, if we focus partly on eliminating these distinctions, uh, I think that equality um, can be more apparent, right? Yeah, absolutely. We're going to get to there. Like, you know, it's something that I think socialists and communists and Marxists have very big problems with surprisingly number have very big comments with like non-differential wages so that's something we're going to get to in this and i'm sure this is going to be like a massive i don't know if bone of contention but definitely a topic of discussion i think there's there's one sentence as well in that last bit that really struck out to me that that we haven't discussed yet is to make these rules binding for the whole production is the essential task of a proletarian revolution i think that is correct I think what we saw like in the revolution, say in, in Russia, and I'm not a, I'm not a Sovietologist or a historian or anything, but like, I think that the revolution, if I was to look at it from, say, somebody who knows a little bit about it, I would look at it that it was a revolution that the main focus of the revolutionaries on some, on some level was the focus on gaining the power. And that is fundamentally necessary in any revolution like don't get me wrong i think that is a fundamental element like without it you've got nothing but like the the purpose of the power yeah that you would get in a revolution is to do this this line here right to make these rules binding for the whole production that's the actual that's the reason that's the reason you have a communist or socialist revolution to abolish the wage form in in the manner we're going to discuss as we get through this book I, I feel like that we, ha if we look at the 20th century and the revolutions that have happened, somebody might tell me if there has been any attempt to get to anything like this uh, uh, in the main. I don't think any of them have actually done this. Elements maybe of the German one or maybe of the revolution, but nowhere was it the overriding task of the of the revolution. You know, not even in Spain, they probably had the more libertarian communist view or the anarchist view. Any closing thoughts then on the first chapter today before we wrap it up? And we want to raise our hand or a leg. Somebody raise a leg. Are we all good? On this episode, you heard the theme tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar.